Are tall buildings sustainable? Do they contribute to the climate crisis or are they, in fact, key to a better future? A hundred years ago, tall buildings offered a picture of optimism. Everyone living in high-rise homes would have access to daylight and fresh air. Life would be very different from the squalor seen in cities of the industrial age. And yet, interestingly, there was also a counter-narrative in popular culture of the times, casting skyscrapers as stage sets for dystopia and disaster. Today, that vision of dystopia persists. Tall has come to denote corporate power and short-term profit. The skyscraper is seen across the world in mindless variations, often with little regard for climate, context, and consumption. If we choose to continue to build this way, what does it say about our priorities? And yet, building tall can offer some positive outcomes. We need only to look at examples of ecological skyscrapers, high-performing buildings that buck the trend of overconsumption. Done right, they can contribute to urban livability, adding public space and amenity to a neighborhood or injecting nature into the heart of the metropolis. So if we are to reinvent the tall building typology today, with everything we know of climate change and urbanization, what would that look like? This video is sponsored by the Holson Foundation for Sustainable Construction. More on them later. But first, what is the working definition of a tall building? The Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats, the world's leading authority on the subject, says that a building can be called tall if it is 14 stories or more, which is at least 50 meters in height. When a tall building is more than 40 or 50 stories, it can be called a skyscraper. For as long as there have been tall buildings, architects, engineers, and the cities that hire them have been in a race to build the tallest. In fact, the world's first one kilometer high tower, the Jeddah Tower in Saudi Arabia, is already under construction. But why do this? Well, to be the tallest may have something to do with vanity or power, or sometimes the technical challenges of figuring it out. To be tall, however, is also a critical economic argument. It makes financial sense. Real estate in city centers can be expensive. The higher the land costs, the higher and denser we build. In 2014, the total value of land in Manhattan, the densest urban area in the US, was estimated at 1.7 trillion US dollars, which at the time was close to the entire GDP of Canada. Put simply, there's always been an economic incentive to build tall. But there is also pressure today to build in ways that are environmentally smart. The real question is, can we do both? To peek into the future of tall buildings, we must unpack the past. The world's first skyscraper, the home insurance company building, was built in Chicago in 1884. At 10 stories high, it was rather modest by today's standards, yet revolutionary for its time. The key to its height and a real game change of the whole building industry in the late 19th century was steel. Structural systems made of steel columns and girders, they eliminated the need for heavy and thick load-bearing masonry walls. A few other technical innovations around that time helped break the glass ceiling, so to speak. The first passenger elevator installed in New York's Hewitt department store in 1857 made it practical to build higher than five stories. Mechanized climate control systems meant that a building's interior could be decoupled from its exterior. The first purpose-designed air condition office building was the Milan Building in San Antonio, Texas in 1928. With this innovation, a building's floor plate could be as deep as the developer wanted, since an occupant's proximity to windows was no longer a prerequisite for comfort. Climate control systems combined with elevators made it possible to build taller and bigger. In other words, the return on investment on a parcel of land could be exponentially higher. The tall building had become a very profitable proposition. Not surprisingly, the proliferation of tall buildings has coincided with periods of economic growth. The first boom came after the depression of the mid-1870s. The second boom coincided with the post-war period in the 1950s and 60s. By then, fossil fuel-based energy was cheap, which made tall buildings affordable to construct and operate. The international style, which found favor in North America in the 1930s, offered a stripped-down aesthetic that was easy to replicate and fashionable. The works of architects like Mies van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, Philip Johnson, conjured an enticing image of the 20th century metropolis, dense cityscapes with towering structures of glass, steel, and concrete. The next big boom was in Asia, where in the 60s and 70s, countries like Singapore and South Korea prospered. China followed in the 80s and 90s. India is now on the same track. Today, it's hard to tell apart the skylines of Buenos Aires from Kuala Lumpur. Many cities around the world are dominated by tall buildings that pretty much look the same. But what does this have to do with sustainable architecture and urbanism? Well, urban density 
which tall buildings make feasible, is critical to the planning of a sustainable city. Density reduces sprawl. It makes infrastructure such as public transit systems possible, which dampens private car use. Too much of it, however, can be overwhelming. In the most crowded parts of Hong Kong, density can exceed 100,000 people per square kilometer, and that's just too many people. Carbon is another hot button topic today. CO2 is one of several greenhouse gases causing global warming. It is emitted by the burning of fossil fuels, an energy source that many cities continue to rely on. Tall buildings have higher emissions than low-rise structures over their lifetime. A recent study showed that a high-rise has twice the emissions of a low-rise alternative given the same population. One factor explaining the emissions gap between low and high-rise is the materials that we use. Concrete and steel, which are commonly used to build tall, have far higher embodied carbon than, say, brick or timber. Embodied carbon refers to the emissions linked to the manufacture, transport, and assembly of materials and products that are needed in construction. Another reason for the gap is everyday energy use. We know that electricity use in office buildings of 20 stories or more can be nearly two and a half times greater per square meter than in buildings of six stories or less. If the source of that power is fossil fuel, now this translates to more emissions. Finally, there is the goal of livability, now central to the conversation on sustainable cities. Quality of human experience is key to the success of any city, no matter the emissions. It's been said that beyond the fifth story, a building disconnects from city life. Tall buildings often fail to contribute positively to the street life that defines the character and enjoyable living conditions of a city. Some critics even say that the scale of a tall building is itself dehumanizing. And for many occupants, life on high floors in airtight boxes is isolating. You are cut off from the city below and often from neighbors in the same building. We will look at how architects are transforming the tall building typology from energy guzzling towers to low carbon structures that contribute to urban livability. But first, let me quickly tell you about the world's most significant competition for sustainable design with a total prize pool of 1 million US dollars the Wholesome Foundation Awards. Francis Carey, the acclaimed architect, won the Global Gold Award in 2012. Prior to winning, few had heard of him, and since, his profile has skyrocketed. At EcoGradia, we celebrate award winners like Carey. This year, we're spotlighting the 2023 winners in an exclusive webinar series. And who knows, next year, you might well be a part of this inspiring group of change makers. The portal for online submissions for the next cycle of the Holson Foundation Awards is now open and it will stay open until February 2025 and it's free. Find out more in our show notes or at awards.holsonfoundation.org. Before we dive into high-performing tall buildings today, it's worth mentioning the work of architects who in the 80s and 90s have cast the mold for the ecological tower, starting with Norman Foster. Foster's HSBC building in Hong Kong, completed in 1985, was one of the first to steer the tall typology towards environmental performance. This 44-story office building, situated in the heart of a very dense city, used a mirror scoop to catch and redirect daylight sideways and down to the building's center, reducing the demand for electrical lighting. Now, another key innovation was the use of seawater for cooling, slashing air conditioning energy costs by 90%. The building's atrium and column-free floor plates were made possible because Foster moved the structural cause of the building from the center to the periphery of the plan. And the idea of gently elevating the building off the tight land parcel it sits on also freed up space to integrate a fully accessible public plaza on the ground. Like the HSBC building, Foster's Commerce Bank Tower in Frankfurt, Germany, completed in 1997, engages with its contacts. The development of this 53-story tower includes amenities on the ground and the restoration of perimeter buildings. A public galleria is at the heart of this scheme, with restaurants and cafes and spaces for social and cultural events. Commerce Bank was dubbed the world's first ecological tower because it set new standards for ventilation and energy use in tall buildings. The offices are naturally ventilated 85% of the year, a feat many thought unattainable for a building that tall. Foster also introduced vertically stacked social spaces at various levels throughout the tower. Meanwhile, in the 90s, a little-known Malaysian architect, Ken Yang, was promoting a treatise on the bioclimatic skyscraper. His two signature projects in Malaysia, Manara Masinyaga in 92 and Manara Amno in 98, linked the form of the building to its passive strategies, ventilation, daylight, and shade. And even though in the end, 
they did not perform as well as what had been predicted. Ken Yang successfully challenged the way we define what it means to be tall and tropical. In place of orthogonal glass towers, he offered a complex vocabulary of recesses and protuberances and brisolets and linked it back to evidence-based performance. Fast forward 20 plus years, one of the big trends in tall buildings today harks back to the early days of the skyscraper when steel was king. Timber is the new rock star. It is deemed exciting because it is a low carbon alternative to concrete and steel. And being a natural material, it also brings a, a biophilic touch to a project. But timber has been around for a long time. Why the resurgence of interest now? Well, in its natural form, timber is not strong enough to bear the loads of tall structures. It is also deemed a risky choice when it comes to fire. Today, architects and engineers have the option to use engineered timber in which layers of timber or veneers are bonded together so that strength-wise, the material becomes competitive with steel and concrete. Engineered timber is also treated to resist the spread of fire. As a result, updated building codes in North America have recently allowed engineered timber to be used in construction that is as tall as 18 storeys. And a European example is the Mjøstona, a mixed-use tower in Brumundal, Norway. At 18 stories high, this was the world's tallest timber building at the time of its completion in 2019. Cross-laminated timber, what is known in the industry as CLT, a form of engineered timber, was used to construct the structure, including the elevator cores. Glue lam or glue laminated timber is another type of engineered timber that was used in this project for the columns and beams. A few years later, the Ascent in Milwaukee in the US took the title of the world's tallest. This is a 25-story apartment building that, unlike the all-timber Mewstoner, uses concrete for its base, elevator, and stair shafts. The rest of the structure is made from CLT and glue lab. This hybrid use of materials is now common to tall buildings that aspire to break the height barrier imposed by using timber alone. It must be said that there are some who question the widespread enthusiasm for timber. For instance, will we risk decimating the Amazon rainforest to build new cities. And if timber must be hybridized with concrete and steel to build a skyscraper, can the project still be considered low carbon? Well, the answer comes down to making educated decisions, knowing how to balance the pros against the cons. This tension is played out in what will be the next tallest timber building in the world, now under construction. At 40 stories high, the Atlassian Central in Sydney, Australia is an office tower with street-level public amenities. The tower structure is subdivided into six vertical sections called villages. Each village, spanning four levels, is made with mass timber construction. These lightweight clusters are supported by a steel exoskeleton and rest on concrete slabs that extend from a concrete core. This multi-village concept achieves two other goals, a reduction in energy demand and the improvement of occupants' well-being. Each cluster holds a naturally ventilated garden that is its own social space. The facades, which are adjacent to the gardens, can be opened to let the breeze in and are fitted with solar panels that provide electricity. Combining these energy strategies with large-scale use of mass timber, Atlassian will halve its overall carbon emissions over a 10-year period. What is remarkable about the Atlassian Central isn't just that it will be low carbon or that it will have a hybrid timber construction or that it will generate renewable power but rather that it combines all of this in a way that transforms occupant experience. Now, a detractor might argue that the Atlassian Central has it easy, benefits from Sydney's equitable climate and moderate density. This building has, so to speak, room to breathe. Would the same strategies work in a dense urban site in, say, a warm, humid climate? Certainly, climate affects many aspects of a building's design, energy demand, material use, comfort expectations. Now, here's an altogether different take on the tall building seen from a tropical standpoint. The Oasia Hotel downtown in Singapore is a 27-story mixed-use development comprising a hotel and offices that is more than 190 meters tall. Completed in 2016, this skyscraper sits in the heart of a dense business district. And unlike the Atlassian Central, it is not a test bed for timber construction. Instead, Oasia experiments with the impact of vertical greening on people, on city and ecology. Three punch-out sky gardens are stacked along the height of the tower to create social spaces for the occupants. These gardens also break down the scale of the building into three people-friendly parts. The gardens are naturally ventilated and shaded, reducing the demand for mechanical cooling in adjacent rooms. What stands out about the Oasia is the extent of its green facade, one of the tallest green walls in the world. 
Plants literally cover the building on all four sides. The total greenery here is 10 times the area of the land that the building sits on. I mean, this is one striking vertical garden. But the architects wanted the green wall to be something more than a feast for the eyes. They also wanted it to be a habitat for animals and insects. To hit the mark, the building deploys over 20 species of climbing plants on the facades, plus 30 more in the sky gardens. In a post-completion audit, over 18 species of animals and insects were found to have made a home there. Analysis has shown that on several ecosystem service indicators, the building is half as good as a tropical forest, which is no small feat considering its size and urban location. So what else do the plants at Oasia do? Well, they reduce the cooling load of the building, estimated to be 40% saving. The plants also mitigate heat buildup in the neighborhood. The envelope surface temperature of Oasia is 10 to 20 degrees Celsius cooler than nearby glass and aluminum clad towers. What examples like the Oasia Hotel downtown and the Atlassian Central show us is that it is possible for a tall building to do well on multiple fronts. It can be low carbon, it can offer uplifting experiences for occupants, it can make the city more livable for all life. Where timber is used, it is an enabler of carbon targets and biophilic design. It is not, however, a black check. A hundred years ago, tall buildings offered hope to humanity, but they became symbols of a dystopian future. It's now time to flip the script. Tall buildings can and should again offer hope, albeit for a different set of constraints and a future that maybe embraces all life, not just our own. Tall buildings aren't going anywhere. The world's urban population is set to hit 6.6 .6 billion by 2050. Now that's 2 billion more than today. If we are to house that many more people, our cities must be dense and compact. And to make that happen, we will need tall buildings. The good news is that tomorrow's tall buildings have the potential to outperform the vast majority of what is built today. What's your view on tall buildings? Any local favorites you think have made your city a better place to live? Please share in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to learn more about the carbon issues brought up today at the Atlassian Central in Sydney, do check out our interview with Stuart Smith, a global circular economy expert with Arab in Germany. And as always, thank you so much for watching.